All right, choose love. Here we go. She was laying there, shaking on the sidewalk in his arms. I couldn't help but stop. Is she okay? Should I call an ambulance? She said, nah, man, I just need a cigarette. I'll be fine. Hey, you got a cigarette? And he said, yeah, this happens all the time. This is the world we live in. Here's the reality I've helped create. This is the mirror I choose to face every day. These are my hands and she is my sister and we are all in this together so I choose to love them anyway. Stay. 
stare at these hands they have moved mountains and this a heart is tattered and torn cause I chose love every damn day
like that. And then I was like, awesome. Awesome. Mom, house, don't forget. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was trying to leave room for a guitar solo. I was like, man, I want to hear that go off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh. No, I like a, I like a, I like a Bakersfield kind of sound. Yeah. Kind of like <laughs> cool, man. Don't give a damn. Feeling kind of lonely. I've been watching. Sorry. All right. <laughs> anyway, we've started rolling. All yes. right. So I always kind of start with like the local crew, and then I'll introduce you guys. So Brett, what's up, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> He's doing the silent thing again. No, no, I'm good, man. I'm, a, I'm having a great time. Good to meet y'all. Yeah. I love playing with you. So, Likewise. Yeah. yeah, great nice to meet jam you. Nice little jam off the bat, right? So, and to meet you officially, for those who do not know you, we have Clementine, darling, and we have Paz mm -hmm. down here. 
Hi. I'm so glad to have you. You're a singer songwriter. You guys have mm -hmm. a, a thing going on. It's a it's well, I mean, it's already been previewed at the beginning of the show, but it has a harkens to the folk Americana, older style country kind of approach. Would is that correct? Would, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So talk about your music. Like where where when did you get started in music? Influences take us down the Clementine Darling pathway. Well, the Clementine Darling Pathway started about four years ago. I entered a song in a songwriting contest right after I wrote it, and I got a call that I got to come sit in at Prairie Sun Recording Studio and sit with Sam Hollander out of L.A. and workshop the song with him. Mm. And uh, we workshopped it, and then the very next day I performed it at a music conference, and that was my very first performance as Clementine <laughs> Darling, and I just... The whole time, I just didn't want anybody to know that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so I went to Office Depot, and I made business cards, and everybody was like, we thought you were super professional. I mean, you had cards. And I'm like, I thought that's what you were supposed to do. So, right. yeah, here I am four years later. Perception is amazing. You know, I, I've had people talk about this before, and they, they, they said, I thought there were like 100, 200 people there when you do it i'm like no no there's like 10 <laughs> you know? like we don't want 200 people down here doing this thing yeah. no it's way better yeah. but perception is and perception is let's say it it's important right when Absolutely. we're in the the social media world that we are in and we're in the visual content world that we are in so that this we create a video sitting on this stage this afternoon for kind of if you think about overall low expense right? Low mm -hmm. effort in some ways. I mean, I have to set up a ton of crap, but you know, it's like, <laughs> it's still in a way it's low effort if you compare it to what it takes to, you know, to have made this kind of a thing, say 40 years ago, maybe 30 years ago, maybe Absolutely. even 20, 10 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah. Anyway, sorry, we got off the Clementine darling thing, oh, but it, perception's important. Absolutely. It's, it's all good. That's, that's part of the story. I mean, I've been playing guitar for about on and off for about 19 years. Mm -hmm. I, I picked it up when I was 15. And I've been wanting to play guitar since I was about eight years old. Mm. So I stole my grandpa's uh, Stella Harmony, 1958 Stella Harmony, when I was eight. By stole, he unfortunately, he had strokes and mm. wasn't able to continue to use it. So sure. I claimed it, didn't really steal it. But my eight-year-old self just needed it. And it took me forever to learn how to play it, but I still have that guitar. Nice. So if you ask when I really got my start, maybe it was when I was eight. Oh yeah. It did like how what was your approach? Because I can I similar similarly similarly uh my in my grandma's house, her one of my aunts had had a guitar back when she was in college or something mm -hmm. and then had just left it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so it had been up in the top of the closet and so she would bring that out and I can think in my mind how I approached the guitar. How did you approach it? Like did you sit down and try to like really figure something out or is it just like banging away on it was just carrying it around like what was how'd you interact with it um well I, i'm the oldest of six so mm -hmm. i had a lot of younger siblings and so i played with the guitar until it had no strings i'm not sure how many years it took for all the strings to disappear <laughs> then i probably just carried it around or played air guitar uh my grandpa loved elvis so we sat and listened to elvis records a lot and that's probably like some of my earliest memories is loving elvis and my grandpa loving elvis so i always wanted to be like elvis and i think i thought just carrying around that guitar made me a little more cool i think right. i still think that <laughs> <laughs> maybe it does perception's everything right exactly <laughs> was there like what what time frame of elvis was there a time frame he was into or was he just like elvis is is the king i mean he is the king right but <sighs> he was an elvis man i mean he, he carried a comb in his back pocket and was always like slicking back his hair yep. i mean even <laughs> after he had a stroke he had to do his hair every day in a mirror and uh but it was I like a wave oh the wave yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah, yeah he had that i think he had that his whole life yeah. but he kept it you know well into his 70s and uh i think I, I was talking today i think like you know 68 elvis when he was just like really in his prime yeah mm -hmm. i think that's really what we would listen to i get that good time to be locked in yeah yeah that's a good time for the king <laughs> yeah yeah the pills hadn't quite taken over yet <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> <laughs> so what was your introduction uh, introduction to music pause um 
I mean, I started off uh, back in fourth grade playing bass in a band called Hostile Audience, which just meant that we were going to make our audience very angry by playing punk music. Well, I'm sorry, fourth grade? Yeah, fourth grade. Nice! <laughs> I mean, I was nice. in the Rage Against the Machine and all that back then. And then my mom signed me up to play in the band, so I had to play the baritone or tuba. Mm -hmm. And I had to walk. I also like, played euphonium. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> it's such a heavy instrument for a fourth grader. And so, yeah, the next year I was like, I got to get a lighter instrument. So I picked up the violin and I've been playing it ever since. And coming from Texas, everybody just wants you to play fiddle in fiddle, a band. Right, and yeah. so, uh, got to have a fiddle in the band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> got out of the hostile audience scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How did that play over the fiddle in the punk scene? Right? Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did a little bit of ska music back in high school, and so it was a lot of fun. Like, we listened to Streetlight Manifesto. Did you do, like, a lot of Pensacato, or, like, how did you handle that? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, the horns took over, but I was yeah. still, like, just part of it. Right, just <laughs> jiving. Yeah. Yeah, let's have pause. Man, pause. Come on, you need to be in the band. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. Just bring that fiddle along. Well, my dad got me an electric fiddle because he didn't want to hear me practicing all the time. Ah. Yeah. So it was the Yamaha silent violin, and then I was able to amplify it with my friends, so... You could kind of hear it with the horns, but the horns just, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> definitely just kept up with the melody that those guys were playing. Yeah. Nice. nice. <laughs> yeah. When did you start playing, Brett? Started playing piano when I was five. Oh. Awesome. My grandma had a little old upright piano just sitting in the living room, and I walk up to it. <laughs> and I play this thing, you know? Okay. When did you move over to the guitar? Was guitar second thing, I guess? Guitar, right? I, I was about 10 years old. Dang. And I, my uncle gave me this. He actually had a his first guitar, which was a 1948K, cool. uh, like acoustic guitar. And it, was, it was all beat up and you know kind of cool. The case was still there and it was torn to pieces, like falling apart. You know? nice. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder that might have instilled your love for for vintage instruments. Yeah, I like I like old guitars. They have a thing to them. I and do. played, mm -hmm. just played guitars. Played, yeah. played anything. They're open. Yeah. They sound opened. You know, yeah. To me, right? Yeah, for sure. So back to like influences. Like where where when did the songwriting thing come about? Like you you've got the guitar. There was no strings. At some point, there were strings again, mm -hmm. right? And then when was like there was a moment that it clicked and it's like oh songwriting is a thing and that's a thing I would like to do like how did that come about I was living in Seattle I was 23 and I had just bought my first guitar again because I had my guitar stolen when I was 20 uh. and so it'd been a few years since I would picked one up but I just moved there and bought a cheap guitar and I would sit in the apartment of my window or the window of my apartment. That's what <laughs> right. it really meant. <laughs> I'm good with it, I believe. <laughs> anyway, and uh, I would sit there before work at like 6 o'clock in the morning and just kind of play songs I would hear, you know, I would stream or whatever. And I think I eventually wrote my first song while living in Seattle. It's not a song that stuck around. Mm -hmm. sure. But, yeah, I just finally was like, those are my words. Like, and was it like a purposeful like did you think like i i want to become a songwriter i am going to sit down and write a song is that how it came about not at all yeah not at all right. all my songs have always been just like kind of a journal entry almost like i need to get this thing out most of my songs are written in one go some of them i sit with or it takes a while for the song to finish itself so to speak um, but when I wrote the song that I wrote and submitted for the songwriting contest, I still had no intention to do what I'm doing today. It was only that I got that call back and got that affirmation that I even continued to pursue it. And it was almost out of curiosity, like, how far can I take this? Mm. And it's been wonderful. <laughs> what part, like, talk about the wonderfulness of it. So just meeting the people I've met, uh, making the friends that I have made friends with and learning to like jam with a band. That was mm. something I just didn't expect to be able to do. I didn't understand the mechanics of it. And when people would suggest that I would get a band, I'd be like, I don't even understand how to play with another person, let alone a bunch of other people. Um, some of the shows I've gotten to play and the, the way I've been able to kind of make friends with people who I considered 
heroes, uh, people I've seen and paid to to go to their shows and seen, you know, 10 or 12 times even over the past like decade. And then I get to like meet them or, you know, be on the same bill as them. And it just blows my mind that, I mean, I, I must be doing something right. Yeah. Well, I'd agree with that. Yeah. That, that's, it is wonderful. I think, um, mentioned this on the last podcast, actually, Chris, guitar player, roommate down here, like he, he mentioned the other day we were talking and he said how grateful he was for being a musician because it, it did give him a purpose. Like mm-hmm. when, when he mm-hmm. got home or when he finished his other, you know, duties or those things that we, we do that, that do pay the bills. Um, when he got finished with that, then he had something like he looked forward to going into. Mm-hmm. And I think that is, you know, music I came up with a lick or a a hook yesterday Mm -hmm. and I was so excited about it. Like I could not wait to get my guitar. You know, it's like, ah, you know, it it drives you and it pulls you. And how great is that to have that in your life? Something that you can't wait to get to. Absolutely. Uh, So do you find this is, I I, I ask this question back and forth in different ways. This question is asked often of songwriters. Mm -hmm. Do you find that it is the lyrics first or the melody first combination thereof like how does the process go for you typically 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 I sit down with my guitar and I just kind of start strumming or picking and singing at the same time and I have to have a pen and pad next to me I'm not good with digital songwriting and I just kind of start scratching things out and typically like I don't change a lot of my songs the way they that they come out I might try to go back and change it and then I just kind of screw it up and go back to the beginning (laughs) Um, I feel like I almost like channel what needs to be said Mm. some of the time or what I need to say or what I need to get out Um, but yeah usually I I don't stop until the song's finished and if I do stop I might not finish that song ever I I I that used to be exactly my style. Mm-hmm. That was a hundred percent it. It was like there was there was something going on in my life, and it was like, okay, how do I understand life? Well, I understand life by trying to summarize it in a song, mm-hmm. right? Trying to tell this story in a, in a in a certain light that maybe now I can understand it because I'm having to basically explain this to someone else, right? Mm-hmm. And we have to explain something to someone else. You're teaching, which makes you think about it more. And so it was kind of like, all right. Maybe if I can get this out. And so I would. I would sit down. I'd muscle through it and muscle through it and muscle through it. And if there was ever that break point where it's like you kind of felt like sluggish on it, the Mm -hmm. passion was kind of down, the fire was kind of down, then I might never look at it again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I was given um, Bruce Springsteen's tracks that it was like a four disc collection, I think. Okay. And it was all this bootleg stuff Mm -hmm. or demos and things. And in that, like in one of the CDs or one of the albums, sections, whatever, <laughs> quarters, um, it might be some portion of like Born in the USA or some portion of another song or like three songs that shared a similar verse mm-hmm. or two songs that had the same melody and these different things. And it was kind of like, oh, wait a second. Like, I can Frankenstein these things. It's like <laughs> there might have been something in this moment where I was inspired like when the fire was hot and it's like, I got, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's good, it's good. And then eventually it's kind of like, uh, okay, yeah. It's mm-hmm. not, you know? And it's like, but if there's some part of that's good, like it almost seemed like, like keeping a little ember, you know, and like kind of yeah. putting that in the pouch and being like, okay, like I've got this tool, I've got this thing that's there for the next time yeah. the fire comes along, like I can feed the, you mm-hmm. know, this into the fire. Ooh. And when I changed that writing style, like it, it became less stressful, okay. I would say. Because and I'm not trying to give any advice no, at all. I I'm just like my it. own journey on this thing. Um, but it, it like it became less stressful to me because I felt like I could marinate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and it was like I can. All right. I've got the fire. I believe in this. I believe mm-hmm. in what I've written thus far, or what I created thus far. So now I'm going to keep the fire stoked, banked, right? Banked, yeah. you know, and, and so when when there's time or energy or something else that comes along. As a matter of fact, that's what's happening right now. The song that I, I, the hook I came up with yesterday fit perfectly to a song I wrote entirely like three, four months ago and I was never satisfied with. You know, it's like coming that's back great. around, like it marinated mm-hmm. to a point and it's still 
I still don't have it yet. <laughs> it's still marinating. It's, it's in the back yeah. of the fridge right now. We get some, you know, some cellophane over top of it. It's doing okay. <laughs> anyway, so how did you guys end up becoming uh, a thing? An open mic. Mm, yeah. 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 We met up at an open mic at a coffee shop. Um, it's a funny oh, story. Yeah, you locked your keys in the van. I locked my keys and my dog <laughs> and my guitar in my van. Oh, and I had a time I had to be on stage and <laughs> he helped me break in with a spoon and oh, we yeah. got on stage five minutes before or we got there five minutes before I had to be on and I was so flustered that I only played one song because I couldn't remember a single other song I knew. <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. There was a a mac and cheese element to this did i hear that no, earlier this oh. was after, a different one yeah this was after okay. we met i went to watch his old band play well we jammed in the van that night yeah and then we I said let's meet back to up. watch his band play and he was on stage with his band and he was eating mac and cheese <laughs> i was hungry he was putting a spittle down <laughs> and he would eat some mac and cheese and he would pick it back up and play a few licks and then put it down and eat some mac and cheese and i was just like Really? <laughs> That's hardcore, man. Yeah, music's just fun. At a certain point, you just, I don't know, you, you realize, like, you're there just to give your passion and give what you got, and sometimes you got to fuel up in the middle of a performance and <laughs> keep it going. Keep the fire going, man. Keep the fuel in there. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Mac and cheese on the stage while performing. That is hardcore, though. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Host, the hostile audience thing coming back around. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, he eat this mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> that would done. That would have done very well at CBGBs. Yeah, right. I mean, they started out to be a bluegrass thing anyway. So like the bluegrass punk mac and cheese on the stage, fuck all kind of attitude. <laughs> like I think this would have done very well there. You just don't know. There's what a time can... and a place, Paz. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> See how we can recreate that sometime. Yeah. <laughs> So what have you what have you done so far? Like have you recordings, Spotify, like how far have you taken this so far? Yeah, so I did. I have re- released two albums. I've self-released them. And the first one uh, I call 1111 EP. And it was some of the first songs that I ever wrote with the intention to do this as Clementine Darling. Um it was supposed to be a four-song EP and the day before I was set to f- record the last two songs, my house burned down in a wildfire and my whole town was on fire. And so I ended up writing a fifth song, Fire Map, about mm. that experience. And so all five songs are on there now. I was able to finish it in somebody's home studio. This man in Marin named Scott Mickelson uh, did me a solid, helped me out, helped me get it done. And so I feel, I love that album and I feel like you can you can feel its rawness and it's like the beginner quality to it so i love that there's just like that starting point um since then i released in 2019 an album called live at the lost church and i recorded Mm, that over a year at the lost church in san francisco Uh at casey turner's open mic Mm -hmm. so i'd write a song and i bring it and perform it and record it every month and then i picked like the best seven songs out of that year and put them on an album and released them so everything I have out there is on Spotify. It's on my website. It's all the sh- on all the streaming platforms. Um, I feel like it's a good example of what I was doing in the beginning when I was more solo. And now that I'm playing with other artists and kind of writing new stuff and stepping, I feel like I'm stepping into like a new phase of this. I'm like ready to get back into the studio and record this next phase. Um, I've kind of written a track list, but that changes all the time. I write new songs and then I, you know, want different things on there. (laughs) So I don't have like a release date for that yet, but I hope to get, I'm going to go record at Prairie Sun Recording Studios in Sonoma County. And I hope to get in there in 2021 and get that completely finished. Nice. Good. Yeah. Good for you. Long answer. Great. No, 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 no. By all means. I mean, this is, it's long format. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So... In who else is in you? There's a third member that's also kind of in the band as well. There's a banjo player. Yeah, that, we have a banjo player. Right. Um, he's from Ohio originally. He lives up in Sonoma County too, mm. and uh, he'll jump on gigs when he needs to. He lives a, a quiet domestic life with his girlfriend and his dog. So nice. you know, when when needed, he jumps in, and yep. when we're just doing our duo thing, he kind of sits back. So he's a great addition. He's great on the banjo but he's been practicing guitar and he's really coming up as a flat picker 
and I'm just excited to see yeah. what we're gonna do. We, we've got some shows coming up, and he's gonna join us. Yeah, that would that would do well in this music for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, he's got like Doc Watson as a hero, and just going straight for it. <laughs> yep. Well, and and what we were talking about earlier. So Doc Watson's from my hometown. That's why, oh. that's why Merle oh, yeah. Fest takes oh. place there. Well, <laughs> he's from like I think I want to say Deep Gap, which is in between Boone and and Wilkesboro. Cool. Like I, have you ever, do you have you ever heard of Boone, North Carolina? Like some people out here know about Boone. And I I only know of like the Boone in California. Yeah, no, it's yeah. it's um, so it's up in the mountains. There's a college actually like some years ago 10 12 i don't remember anymore like i did like became national champions i was little mountain college like with barely anybody there mm -hmm. it was crazy now of course the place blew up but anyway boone's up on the mountains and i'm we're down the foothills i tell people it's like if you lose your brakes going down the mountains you will die in our home in my hometown <laughs> yeah. but deep gap is like right in between the two and that's where doc watson's from that's and hard. and right when um Around the time, was it right around the time he died? I don't know. But in Boulder, Colorado, there is a statue of Doc Watson. In Boulder, Colorado. Oh. Like, that blew my mind. I thought, wow, like, right here in the middle is Doc. Is that right? Or was there just, like, crazy posters? I don't know. It was crazy. <laughs> it was a relation last <laughs> yeah. time I was in Boulder with, with Doc Watson there. But a lot of influence. So take us down the path of some of your influences like when you are identifying as a songwriter as you were self-teaching how to become a songwriter like who who i say self-teaching right mm -hmm. but who were you studying like who in the very beginning and when i was living in seattle it was bright eyes connor Oberst. oh yeah yeah sure yeah um, prolific writer <laughs> yeah i think it fit the mood of living mm -hmm. in seattle mm -hmm. and where i was at in my life at the time is and he is he from there as well? he's from omaha nebraska oh okay but, but just, he's always it always seems like the shows I've heard of him about has all been in the Pacific Northwest or in California. Yeah, but, he's he's in LA now, I think. Okay. But he might be back out in Nebraska, not sure. But his his writing and just the mood of it is just so honest. Like he can say he's feeling deep despair, sadness, um, you know, having mental health issues, whatever it is, and say them say it so eloquently that people just love him for it and I, I do too. And so in Seattle, I think I was deeply pulling from not only Connor's music, but kind of Connor and friends. So I was mm -hmm. listening to the Felice Brothers. I was listening to Jenny Lewis. I was listening to Rilo Kiley. I think Rilo Kiley's music was probably a pretty big influence on what I was writing back in Seattle. Um, and I didn't really get into the total folk Americana vibes until I came down to California, living in Sonoma County, it's kind of like standard thing. Yeah, it's easy to get into that. <laughs> it's like yeah. kind of like the Nashville of California right. in a way. <laughs> yeah. Just a lot of pot smoking hippies. <laughs> <laughs> that play yeah. Americana. Absolutely. Sonoma Cana is what they call it now. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> we were talking earlier, um, Oliver Ocean, who, mm -hmm. who you're familiar with, like he, he was down here last year uh, with his band Strange Fiction, and that was a great night. That was a <laughs> great night. I mean, they played like monsters. Nick Kraft, that drummer, I, I love Nick. Like, I, I text him every once in a while, just like, <laughs> keep like, hey, Nick, how are you, buddy? You know, I, I, we went inside and jammed afterwards, and that was one of the better jams of my life. That was mm. a lot of fun. Yeah. Right on. Yeah, I, I want to get up there and, and see the scene. What is the scene like? Is it mostly wineries and coffee shops are there any but i mean i realize in marin like there's Sweetwater and and mm -hmm. but those are bigger venues i mean those are those are big leaps to get in there yeah um what where are you guys playing we do a lot of wineries and um i'm trying to think of like what the stages are because it's been a while you know this yeah. pandemic right, and stuff. Sure, yeah, so yeah. um you know we got the mystic unfortunately who survived right yeah exactly yeah. We have the Mystic and we have the Phoenix, but those yeah. are pretty big theaters yeah. to get into. What would you say, like the middle, the Lost Church just sure. opened up in Santa Rosa. Yeah. They, they oh, have yeah. a small one. So that listening room opened up a few months before and they're yeah. still open. They're still fighting for it. Um, who would you say? Any other, any other places that mm, could There's the, like the Big Easy, which is kind of middle ground, but they have That's an right. incredible sound system. Uh, and you can eat dinner and watch bands and it's dance like, around. People get crazy in there. Yeah. The speakeasy, Petaluma. Yeah, that's okay. a pretty, pretty good room. Yeah, nice stage area. You kind of have access, I guess, to Berkeley as well. Not that super close, mm -hmm. but 
that's not too bad to get over there. Yeah, I used to play in the city, you know, once a month, once every couple months. Right. What's amnesia. Gonna be, what's still going to be open in the city? I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> what is, is Hotel Utah opening back up? Like. I honestly, I'm not sure what's open, what's not. I mean, we were doing the Save the Stages thing for a while. Yeah. I know Amnesia closed right before yeah. the pandemic. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who comes back and some of those like smaller to medium-sized stages who can support acts and have people and stuff. Because I see, you know, the Fillmore starting to do stuff and yep. Fox and yep. yeah. Yep. Yeah, UC Berkeley started doing our UC Theater in Berkeley. Mm-hmm. And then uh, here in town, the they're going to do, they do a Friday night music series thing, and that's going to be opening up in August, which is an outdoor thing. So okay. I guess that's still a little bit. I don't know how they're going to separate everybody. I mean, it's used to like a thousand people every Friday night would congregate in this little area. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens now. But yeah. <laughs> I don't I know. Mean, it's it's interesting times. Yeah, I was gonna say there's some places over in Napa that are mm. cool to play. We're oh. playing at Jam Cellars in June, and um, it's like a tasting room, but they put on bottle rock. Oh yeah, so yeah, they're yeah, very yeah, music centric sure. and. Nice. We're really excited to play there. Um, we've also played Blue Note, which typically mm-hmm. they do jazz, but sometimes they'll do like folk Americana nights or locals nights, and we just love playing there too. Is that in Napa? That's in Napa. I think Zach yeah. has played there. Zach Freitas, mm-hmm. I mentioned earlier. I think he used to go, because he would go up to Napa. This is probably more like 18, like 2018, because mm-hmm. the busking, like he was making great tips and yeah. stuff. But then he, mm-hmm. and then from that, he ended up getting hooked up with two places that he's playing regularly and I think Blue Note was one of them. Okay. Yeah, he's got a thing in Monterey going now though. He's I don't think he goes much outside of that. Yeah. But, um so what's what's next? Like I mean the album, like okay, mm-hmm. let me ask that a different way. Okay. All right. So we know what's next. Album. Are you thinking about the aspect of how once this is recorded, like how how are you going to proceed? How does Clementine Darling get beyond where you are now? Besides just capturing it, right? Mm-hmm. It's one thing to capture it, but mm-hmm. how do you get how do you how do you make that into something more like what pays the bills? Honestly, I'm trying to figure that out right now because this this old world, new world, new old world, I don't know what that looks like. Right. And so I am a pretty fairly small fish in this big pond. And so I get to watch my heroes get back on stage and go play these big festivals. And I get to watch, you know, some of these bands, local bands that I've been loving for a decade, start to get out and play the smaller stuff. But I'm not sure how long it'll take for, you know, the people who were still climbing to get back up and climb that ladder. So what I've started to do on the side, it's pretty new. I just started last week and I'm doing it again this week is sync writing for television and film and commercial Mm -hmm. and co-writing with people. And so last week I wrote with a pop group um, out of like LA and Canada and we wrote more like pop centric music Mm -hmm. uh, with a woman named Daphne Willis and a man named Volley Martung. And next week I'm writing with a folk Americana singer out of Nashville, Kaishona Armstrong, who I watched pl- I watched her play a virtual Zoom concert this spring and just loved her music. So it's cool when you get this full circle moments where you get to watch somebody and then work with them when you never imagined that you'd even get to do that. And so I that's kind of how I'm approaching it. Like when a door opens, I will walk through it. I will check it out. But to try to plan for a tour or how even the future album's release will look, that's kind of hard to do right at this moment. But I hope it'll look somewhat the same. I I would like to have a room full of people and release an album and get to get real intimate and celebrate and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 The, the, um, I think the thing you, you nailed there is networking. And there is so much importance in networking mm-hmm. because if you have something that's that people gravitate towards or can relate to, then they'll open doors for you. And and mm-hmm. so if you, I, I like your approach. It's like the the collaborative songwriting aspect with people that might be further along in their careers than you are. Mm-hmm. And so maybe there's an element of that that opens up another door. Um, I mean, 
frankly, anytime you have an opportunity to play, right? You never know what the end result of that opportunity can be. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, definitely networking, networking, networking. And that can take place, that can take the place of an awful lot of time. And I know that Facebook would hate to hear me say this, but an awful lot of time wasted on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's probably a lot more, I've not really thought about this till now. It certainly seems like a lot more valuable time to focus that network that is social media and focus the network that is the internet and focus the network that is musicians like earlier we were talking I think before the camera started like it's so great to be a musician because it does take you to some interesting places Mm -hmm. and it allows you interesting freedoms as well I think honestly societally musicians or creators are looked at differently mm-hmm. and so we kind of get away with stuff we do. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we do. it's true right <laughs> and i think it's a level of appreciation like mm-hmm. i do i believe it's an ingrained thing that goes way back to when we were just fucking banging on rocks or where we were doing and 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 communing around the fire and and what was left of our food or whatever the thing was i think it goes all the way back there like it's it's part of our dna it's part of the evolution it hasn't left us Mm -hmm. and so when you are able to bring that to a population of people by which they they resonate with that you hit their frequency then i think they turn around it's kind of like cool man like whatever you got going on it's cool man thanks man that sounded good dude you know like yeah. that that's it's a great thing like it's a blessing to have that you know that it kind is. of a thing right definitely mm-hmm. i mean i've had the police called on me before many a time for busking <laughs> and i never get in trouble i always get the opposite where it's like we really like your music you sound really great like if it was up to us we'd tell you to turn it up But that lady over there doesn't like it, and she wants you to turn it down. But, like, maybe just go over here instead. That's cool. (laughs) Not, like, turn it off, get out of here. Right. You know, stop begging for change. But it's always just met with, like, super cool vibes. And, yeah, it's a privilege I don't think you would get if you were doing other things that got the cops called on you. You, you, I mean, you don't even, you don't get that. No offense to anyone. No offense to anyone. But you don't get that if you're like a mid level manager at blah 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 blah. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like you don't yeah. get that freedom. You don't get that that like, you know, you're doing something that maybe even you could be ticketed for, but exactly. the cops are like cool about it. Yeah. We we I was at a party um a few weeks ago in Oakland and man, the music was phenomenal. Oh my gosh, <laughs> these were some like I mean, legitimately like people had degrees in their instruments. These are some top notch players. Mm-hmm. They all make their living playing music. It was so cool. And uh they're like, okay, last song. We love you, neighbors. You know, thank you, neighbors. <laughs> it was cool, man. We were up on the roof, and, like, you were overlooking San Francisco and Oakland, the Bay and stuff. It was an amazing place. And um, the cops, so then they, they're like, they started jamming one more time. They couldn't stop themselves, right? And the cops show up. And, you know, it's about midnight. And so a couple of the guys, they, like, run out there to meet the cops in the driveway. And the cops were like, look, honestly, like, we were down at the bottom – of the street like listen you guys sound amazing like it was really good <laughs> but we've had like a lot of complaints <laughs> now so you're gonna have to shut it off like you're done but it sounded great guys you know it's like how many parties do they show up to where there was like a horn line you know and like a really amazing horn line you know but again like being a musician being an artist I, mm-hmm. thank you thank you you know it seems like society does allow you some some leeway definitely because yeah. it, thank you, know, you society <laughs> exactly yes, thank you we're cool we're on grateful that. We're very grateful on this we want to continue it yeah don't stop <laughs> <laughs> awesome well we have an offer to go and play some more music um do you want to go investigate that yeah yeah all right Sounds cool fun. yeah so we've got my buddy peter van dyke who uh, pete you're gonna be watching this i know you are so that was a shout out to you uh <laughs> great musician um great soul like in in I'll say a little bit about Peter. Um, he just lost his mother. And his mother, I believe she was... Nah, I, I, there were two people who just lost elderly parents in the past couple of weeks that I was talking to. I, I want to say 92 or 98. She was, she had lived a good long life, let's say that. And as I've not yet... I apologize, Peter. I've not yet read um, on the website the eulogy. But he was talking about her. She was really an icon. And their family history goes back to like... 21 um and when peter's grandfather moved from croatia and started a farm in cupertino 
And then that ended up branching out. And back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when women still were not, certainly in agriculture, were not, you know, looked at favorably. Her mm-hmm. husband, I'm not sure at what point that they they divorced, but he was a teacher. You know, he wasn't the farmer and she mm-hmm. was the farmer. And, and she was lambasted and really kind of ridiculed and, and shut out of a lot of things. And she kind of was like, nah, fuck that. And, she, and within, he said within kind of two years of, of, of making her decision, like, I'm not going to take this, then all of a sudden she became an advisor and, and someone that, you know, a lot of people were looking up to and whatnot. But, yeah, that's, that is, that was Peter's mother. I unfortunately don't know her name at the moment, but rest in peace. And Sounds like uh-huh. a lovely woman. Absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, we should all read that eulogy. But mm-hmm. uh, Peter, like I said, he's a great soul, great musician, um, great farmer. He just brought over his enormous cabbage that I've been eating <laughs> off for like a week. It was so good. It was amazing. <laughs> and other things. But uh, jazz, anyway. Jazz cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> and fruit trees. Fruit trees is what I meant to say. Yeah, fruit trees. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, all right, cool. So let's go let's go play some music. All right. All right peace out everybody. Thank you.